Sarah's been doing a lot of the posting on our distance learning page. So if you've been checking it out and keeping up with the posts, Sarah's behind a lot of them. So you can thank Sarah for the really cool content. Um, this is the first in our fall gardening series today. Um, for those of you that have been with us before, you probably know the rules, but just a reminder that you can submit questions using the chat. We're gonna go through them. You can also put them in the Q&A, that is fine too. We save all the questions until the end. Make sure you are all muted. Um, we'll be here for about an hour. And then uh, we are gonna post this on the distance learning page with some follow-up resources. You will get an email after the workshop today that lets you know that, that um, those follow-up things are live. So you can check back for that a little bit later on. And um, without any like further chit chat, I'm gonna let you get into the workshop today so you guys can take it away. All right, so today's fall gardening workshop, we're gonna be covering a lot of ground. Um, just a disclaimer, most of the stuff we're talking about today is outdoor gardening. So if you're just doing stuff inside your apartment or inside your home, this may not be super relevant for you, but you'll still learn some cool stuff. Um, but we are going over like raised beds and outdoor container gardening, uh, landscaping and things like that. So we're gonna talk about what can you still grow in the fall and what are, uh, should you be planting this time of year? We're gonna go over um, frosts, season extension, and all the different ways you can extend your season, whether it's just by a couple of weeks or even months or the whole winter, if you really wanna get into it. Uh, we'll go over how you can save any of your seeds if you wanna try that. Um, we're gonna go over cover crops, which you do still have time for if you like run out right after this workshop <laughs> and go buy your cover crops and plant them today you may have time to still get in some cover crops before it gets too cold. Um, and then we'll go over some just general fall chores for around uh, your house or apartment, how to prep your beds for winter, get them all ready for next spring and give them a good head start. And then we're gonna end with some tasty fall recipes that we will give you the recipes for in all our follow-up resources. Next slide. Yeah, so I definitely thought that because we're doing this fall planting workshop, it makes sense to really bring everything back to where agriculture came from. So definitely the roots and honoring the indigenous and African customs that we use in today's agriculture and bringing awareness to how their efforts were truly organic and worked in harmony with both man and nature. And on top of that, a lot of the schools that we work with, um, they plant three sisters garden beds to learn about history, to learn about companion planting, um, intercropping, and, and all of these different techniques that we kind of take for granted in today's uh, agricultural world, right? We just think that, oh, we just know all of these things, but all of these things came about from like thousands of years of, you know, practice. Yeah, and this is a great tribute to do as you're harvesting things in the fall because these three sisters, the corn, beans, and squash, those are the types of things that are being harvested right now. So it's always good to keep that in mind as you're harvesting. Your All yeah, right. Definitely. Next slide. Um, okay, so we're gonna go over in this section, frosts, what you're gonna plant now to harvest in the spring, what you're gonna plant now, if you even wanna get into harvest this before this winter hits, and then we're gonna go over different bulbs and rhizomes. Next slide. So frosts can be uh, confusing and they are confusing for everyone because there's no one set day. Uh, we wish that we could have like the, a fortune teller tell us exactly when is that hard frost going to hit so that we could plant and plan our gardens perfectly, but all we can do is predict using past data and weather patterns and climate patterns. So it may be kind of confusing because you actually can garden through the first few light frosts. It depends on how frost tolerant your plants are. Um, so certain things like uh, are going to be very like um, not going to do well with the light frost. They'll just die off right away, but some of them can actually keep going until they hit that really hard frost. So a light freeze or a light frost refers to temperatures that are just a little bit below freezing just for a few hours. 
Um, but at some point in the year, and that's what this frost date is based on, this November 20th, you're going to have a hard frost where the temperatures is going to drop below 30 degrees um, and it's going to stay that way for a few hours and that's actually going to kill most of the plants that you have in your garden. Um, and so we have an average date of the first frost for New York City area is November 20th, but this can actually vary based on where you are located in New York City. So if you're gardening in the Bronx, you may get that hard frost before someone gardening in um, like Brooklyn or Long Island or something like that. So you do want to keep in mind that the earliest frost could come as soon as October 19th, um, but plan loosely for it to happen around mid-November and you even could get all the way into December and still not have a hard frost. But we usually use mid-November as the planning day. Just keep in mind that it could come sooner or later. Next slide. So these are some of the frost tolerant plants that uh, if you already have a garden and you already have these things growing, you don't have to worry too much about the first few light frosts. So we've got kale, chard, um, radishes, onions, garlic, turnip, beets, carrots. Those types of things can survive the first few light frosts. Things like cabbage um, can even survive the hard frost. So if you already have these things growing in your garden, um, they'll probably be good. You don't have to worry about them too much. Next slide. Oh yeah, sorry guys, my, my video went out for a bit. Um, so um, this uh, planting guide is loosely based off of the first frost happening on November 15th. And like Laura said, this is completely um, subject to change. Uh, we don't really, we don't really know, right? Um, but here are some of the things that you could plant now to have a spring harvest. So garlic, uh, most of the time people will plant this in like late September. But pro tip for garlic is that because it varies based on location, like Laura said, you can determine when to plant it based on soil temperature. So if the soil temperature is at 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15.6 degrees Celsius um, at a depth of four inches, then you it's optimal to plant your garlic, um, as well as potatoes, which are also typically planted in September, but they also can be planted um, six to eight weeks before the average last frost date. So depending on when the frost date is, you can still get some potatoes in, uh, but potatoes are very sensitive to any kind of frost. So covering the sprouts with like mulch or any type of artificial covering is probably best. And artificial covering can be anything from like black plastic bags to a tarp or even a sheet. So potatoes will let you get away with a lot. Um, and for this slide is about winter harvest. So I thought that this one was really great because most of the time we think about closing up shop for the winter and we don't really think about anything alternative that we can grow, but things actually can do really well, especially if you use some season extension techniques that Laura's going to get into later. So lettuce, radishes, turnips, um, Swiss chard, spinach, these can all be done by seed. There are also stuff that you that you can do if you have seedlings. So maybe you have a spare greenhouse that just so happens to be making these great starts um, <laughs> that you have in the middle of November or October. If that's the case, then you can feel free to plant those now and not worry too much about whether or not they're going to do well. Next slide. <laughs> Another thing that you can plant this time of year that you can plant in the fall um, are a lot of bulbs and rhizomes. So uh, in, and these are for flowering in the spring and summer. Um, so a, a lot of times every year we get a couple of requests from people in the spring asking if we're going to give away daffodil bulbs because they really, they see some of them flowering and they want to plant them. Uh, and we have to tell them, oh, you're going to have to wait until next fall that you can plant them in the fall and they need the um, a, a period of winter they do need like to go dormant and and 
get that coldness from the ground for months. And that's actually what's going to spark them, uh, the processes for them to flower in the spring. So a lot of bulbs do need to be planted in the fall. So now is the time to do that before the ground freezes. So in this picture, we've got uh, the giant aliums. And so those are in the mushroom family, but they're a bulb and they're really beautiful. They have those big pom-pom flowers. So if you want those next summer, make sure you plant them now. Same goes for, what do I have on there? Crocus, daffodil, hyacinth, lily tulips, snowdrops. If you only have shady spots where, where you're planting, um, you can do crocus, snowdrop, and iris. Those ones are the types of bulbs or rhizomes that can do pretty well. When you're planting these in the fall, uh, they're not super picky. You just bury them very shallowly in the ground. They don't even have to be covered by inches of dirt. They kind of just, just put them right under the dirt. And then you'll water them once right after you plant them just to help everything settle. But then after that, you don't have to do anything to them and they'll just come up next spring or summer. Next slide. Another type of growing or planting that you wanna do now if you haven't done it yet is uh, separating your bulbs and rhizomes if they are overcrowded. So in this picture, these are iris rhizomes. Um, and so you can see that they're very crowded. They're right on top of each other. And if I just left them like this next uh, summer, they're not gonna flower very profusely. So you wanna make sure if they're getting overcrowded and they're kind of on top of each other, all you have to do in the late summer or early fall, and we're right kind of at the end of that season right now, you just take them out of the ground. You'll actually cut them so that they each have like a few inches of rhizome on them. And then you have extra rhizomes that you can plant in a new spot or you can give away to friends um, or donate to someone else who wants them. But you'll have to separate these types of rhizomes or bulbs usually every three to five years, but it depends on how crowded they are. Next slide. Yeah, oh, and another thing, um, Laura, is that mm -hmm. remember you said like after, when you're planting them, you water them immediately, but then after that, you don't need to water them again. Yeah, they're very low maintenance and all those kinds of bulbs are drought tolerant. They don't require extra water really. So we're gonna get into, now that we've gone over different things that you can actually still be planting or keeping alive this time of year. I'm gonna go into some different methods for season extension. And in a temperate climate like New York, even just having a few weeks of season extension, you can get a lot of produce yield out of that. Um, it can make a big difference. We usually love to recommend these season extension techniques to schools because in a normal year, the kids would be coming back to school and that would give them a whole nother month of being able to be out in the garden and growing stuff. Um, so I'm going to go over four methods. Plant placement, which is the cheapest, requires nothing, uh, no extra materials. We got row cover, um, which is taking it one step farther. Then you could build a cold frame if you want to give yourself a little more time. And then the most intensive season extension technique is to build or install a greenhouse or a hoop house. So let's go into plant placement. Next slide. So this is zero cost. All it means is you're just gonna strategically place your plants where they can get more heat and sun. So um, one thing you can do if you already have a container garden, um, so if you have like pots or things uh, on your patio or, or on your, not on your fire escape, but if on a balcony or something like that, what you can do at night, if you hear that there's a cold snap coming or you see the forecast is getting cold at night, what you're gonna wanna do is just move them closer into the building so that they're actually, you can keep them outside, but they're just next to the building, which will protect them from wind. It'll, the heat of the building will keep those plants a little warmer and more protected so that they'll make it through some of those light frosts uh, a bit easier. You can also pot up certain types of herbs um, and so here in this picture, we have rosemary. So if you have that in, in a raised bed, say, outside in your garden, you can actually dig, uh, dig it up as if you're transplanting it, um, put it in a pot and bring it indoors for the winter. And that'll work with parsley, sage, and rosemary. It does depend what kind of herb you're trying to do this with. It pr 
probably won't work for basil because basil is an annual herb. Once it starts flowering, uh, it's kind of just like done. It's not gonna taste good. It's not gonna survive even if you bring it indoors. Um, so once you do have the types of plants that you want to bring indoors, you're gonna wanna just place them where they can get the most hours of sunlight possible. Uh, even though it's nice and warm inside your house and maybe you keep it at like a hot 72 all winter long, um, the plants, they do still, they're gonna notice because of the sun patterns, um, they're gonna notice that it's winter. So they're not gonna flourish or thrive quite as much as they would in perfect conditions in the summer, but you should be able to, a lot of them, you can try to keep them going throughout the winter, uh, just with managed expectations that they will have lower uh, production. Next slide. All right, so this is technique number two. We've got row cover here. And so the row cover is just the white stuff on top. Um, so this is pretty easy, it's pretty cheap. You can even just use, if you have like a clear plastic tarp, even that will kind of suffice as um, trapping the heat inside. If you're using just clear plastic, I would recommend cutting holes in it, making sure it does get some air circulation. Uh, and you may only wanna use that uh, during the cold nights, not leave it on there all day because it could kind of suffocate the plants. If you're gonna go out and buy actual gardening or farming row cover or fleecy row cover, those allow moisture in um, as well as heat and light. So for those, you could just leave it up day and night if you wanted to. Um, here you can see that there, it's kind of propped up by using these metal, metal hoops, which makes it uh, technically considered a low tunnel. But you can just use any spare piece of wood or stake or trellis, just something to keep it up um, above the plants that you have in there. Um, kind of a similar concept to row cover. What we're doing is just trapping the heat in, basically. So even if you have something like a five gallon container um, or like those storage tubs or toters, I actually have done just, I'll prop them up using an old window pane that I like find lying around and that will also trap more light and heat in into the plants. So you're just kind of trying to think what is going to actually help the plant harness what little heat we have left in this fall um, and just making sure it's still somehow getting air circulation in there at the same time. Next slide. I really like this picture because all they're using is row cover and you can see that they're growing these uh, frost tolerant greens with a bunch of snow in the background. So row cover can be a pretty powerful season extender. Uh, I know this isn't what most people's landscape are that they're working with in New York City gardening, but I just liked the juxtaposition. Like you've got this little protected haven and the snow in the background. All right, next slide. So here we've got a cold frame and this is basically like building a teeny tiny house for your plants. Um, and so we've got basically a raised bed and that has these glass panes that again is just trapping the heat in there much like um, a greenhouse would, except on a much smaller scale. You can open it up during the day to get the more air circulation in there. Um, it's usually these cold frames are tilted towards the sun to harness extra energy. We do have building plans, I believe for this if you want a carpentry project. So we can put that in the follow-up resources um, and this, since it's enclosed, it's really protected from the wind because it's in this like little house. You can keep things growing in here through December probably. Yeah, and also another tidbit about cold frames is they're really good at um, pest deterrence. So like if you have these little greedy squirrels, um, having oh, yeah. cold frames <laughs> save you so much time and energy. No one wants to fight a squirrel. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> All right, next slide. Uh, this is kind of a cold frame as well. I just put that up there because it's a different type of, uh, kind of like an even lower budget one that's just using the clear plastic. Um, and again, you can see that it's tilted to capture the sun. And so that's what we're really trying to do is just what's the most efficient way to capture, um, to capture the heat we have left. Next slide. 
we have, this is uh, if you're, if you want to invest in a, a structure, this is like pretty permanent infrastructure that you can put on your property. Um, so we've got greenhouses and hoop houses. So these are more spacious. Uh, you can grow a lot more stuff in here. Um, but again, the installation can be kind of tricky. So you will need a couple people to help with it probably. Um, and it's gonna be more expensive to buy the materials to do this. So the difference between a greenhouse uh, and a hoop house or, or a high tunnel, greenhouses generally refer to when the structure is heated. So that means you're paying extra even to have extra heat in there. Uh, usually involves like a fan system and artificial heating. A hoop house or a high tunnel is kind of when you just have this structure that is uh, capturing the sun and heat but doesn't have any uh, added artificial heat. So if you're going all the way for a greenhouse, um, you can grow pretty tropical things in New York City, even in the middle of the winter. Um, so that's going to give you the most options for growing. With a hoop house or high tunnel that doesn't have extra heat added to it, uh, you can still do um, hardy uh, frost tolerant plants pretty much all throughout the winter as well. Uh, you won't be able to do like tropical things or tomatoes or anything like that, but you can definitely have some stuff going all year. Next slide. So now we want to get into some of the more just like general fall chores that are going on this time of year. So I'm going to go over a few different things. This is kind of like landscaping um, information about what to prune, what not to prune in the fall. Uh, I'm gonna go over what to do with your fall leaves and hint, you don't have to do much. Uh, we've got seed saving. Um, we're gonna go over some cover crops if you do wanna try to squeeze that in before the end of the year, or maybe you just wanna save that cover crop information for next year or next summer. Yeah. Um, and then we'll also go into how to prepare your beds for the winter so that you're maintaining and saving all of the nutrients that are in there, protecting the soil that you have and the, and the biome in it. All right, next slide. To prune or not to prune. Um, a lot of stuff you actually are supposed to prune in the spring. So I'm just going to go over the couple of things that you want to prune in the fall. Um, when I'm talking about pruning, basically what it will usually mean when we prune things is you're getting rid of old growth to encourage new growth. And that's why a lot of it is saved for the spring. Um, because right now we're not trying to encourage new growth. Everything is starting to go dormant for your landscaping and things like that. But the couple of things you will prune this time of year is any plants that have disease. So in the picture here, we have bee balm, and uh, that plant is very prone to getting powdery mildew, so it's that white film that you see on, on bee balm and phlox a lot of the time. So if you have a plant that has diseased, uh, diseases on it, you definitely want to get rid of that as soon as possible. So get rid of that in the fall, trim it all the way down to the soil level. You don't want to leave any part of the plant extended um, above ground. And then what you're going to do with that diseased plant is uh, throw it away. Don't put it in your compost because you don't want the disease to get into your compost because then you'll just put it right back in your garden again next year. <laughs> yeah. so just get rid of anything that has disease um, on it. Let's see, another thing to prune. Um, let me go back. Yeah, thanks. So another thing to prune this time of year is hostas because after the frost, you'll notice they'll get brown and die and slugs love to live in them apparently, so you wanna get rid of those. And then uh, the iris and lilies, you just cut them back to a couple inches above uh, ground level. Next slide, thanks. So um, the things not to prune in the fall, I wanted to go over that just a little bit so that you kinda of understand why we wanna leave some of this stuff up because I think even I sometimes feel the urge, like it's fall, it's the end of the season, I'm gonna cut everything down, make it look really nice and tidy. Yeah. But the reason that you wanna keep some really important stuff in there is because we wanna maintain the ecosystem that we have in our gardens. We wanna make sure that our beneficial bugs, our native pollinators, and our birds are all able to kind of 
take advantage of the garden as well and get what they need from it. So for example, we wanna leave all our native plants um, and native flowers. So here in the picture, we have echinacea, a purple cone flower, which is a native plant. And throughout the, the fall and the winter, it'll start to dry out, the seeds will dry out, fall to the ground. And that's what the birds are gonna be depending on for, uh, for food throughout the winter. So we wanna leave all those kinds of things that have seeds. So sunflowers, black-eyed Susans, and things like that. A lot of ornamental grasses or native grasses we also want to leave out because uh, native bugs are specially adapted to lay their eggs in there um, and, and also just kind of stay alive by making their habitat um, in those types of native plants and stems. So you do want to leave those around. Um, and then we've got really hardy things like mums and evergreens and trees. You want to leave those alone for the fall. Um, same with perennial herbs because what those, since they're coming back next year, um, we want to protect their root system under the ground. And so keeping their foliage on there and not cutting it back. So that'll actually protect the roots from a lot of wind and cold. So we do want to leave some stuff um, the way it is because it has like very a, a good reasons for keeping it there. All right, next slide. And then um, I did just want to go quickly over, if you do need to clean up your garden beds, um, the stuff you're going to take out of there is going to be like your annual veggies. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, things that like they're annual, once their season's over, they're done, those you're going to take out. Um, and also because a lot of times they do, like a lot of tomato just happens to get tomato blight or other types of fungus or disease. So you do just want to get rid of those things. So annual veggies, get rid of those. Um, but if you have perennial beds, again, you're, you can leave it. And um, I think next we have leaves. So uh, raking fall leaves, the quintessential autumn chore that you don't actually have to do. Um, they're actually pretty good for protecting the ground. Um, they act as a mulch in your garden. So uh, having a layer of leaves can also help protect the nutrients in your soil throughout the winter. Um, it can help create an, a layer of insulation for any of your perennial plants. Uh, and even if they're not doing that, they are just gonna decompose as long as it's not too many like layers of leaves. If you do have to rake your leaves for some reason you need that, that section clean, um, then you can uh, put them in your compost. If it is completely dried, crinkly leaves, those are gonna be browns, so they'll add uh, carbon to your compost pile. Or you can just rake your leaves, um, put them in a, a trash bag all winter long, and eventually they will turn into a leaf mulch, which is kind of like a compost, and you can use that on your beds in the future. So the autumn leaves, you don't have to get rid of them. Next slide. Yes, and... Uh... Laura, can you put up that poll? Um, yes. To save or not to save is the question. <laughs> so why do we save seeds? To save money, to preserve a special heirloom variety, to trade with friends, all of the above. Yeah, so seed saving is definitely um, one of the things that we think about when we talk about getting ready, getting the garden ready for the fall, um, trying to start something up in the spring. We always be like, you know, gosh darn it, I forgot to save the seed from that uh, big beef tomato <laughs> last year. Um, and a lot of people said all of the above. And so, yeah, like we definitely want to have the advantages to save money and not have to buy the same seeds over and over again. We definitely want to be able to get different varieties that may not be offered um, commercially. And we also just want to be able to preserve the ecology and the seed purity, right, of some of the stuff that we're growing. And so this is also like a practice that has, be, has been um, created since the beginning of agriculture. And, you know, at the same time, seed saving is not easy because the seed ripeness, it varies between different types of crops. 
And there's also like a variety of considerations that need to be made <laughs> when it comes to different crops. So I'm not saying, you know, seed saving is the easiest thing to do. You know, for example, pepper seeds are ripe when the fruit is at its full color and they start to shrivel a little bit while cucumber seeds are ripe when the cucumber is overripe and no longer edible, right? So for the pepper seeds, you could save the seeds and still eat the pepper. The cucumber, you could save the seeds, but you can't eat it anymore, right? So it can be kind of confusing when we're thinking about what to save or what not to save or even how to save. So also for beets and onions, you can let them flower and you can later save the seeds or you can harvest the entire vegetable when it's ripe with the root attached, store it over winter and then plant the entire bulb in the spring. And, you know, uh, I knew you guys were going to ask me about the hybrids. I see it in the chat. Like, <laughs> I have all the answers today. Um, so let's go to the next slide because um, that's where I'm offering you guys a whole bunch of tips um, for seed saving. So tip number one to answer your question, only save seeds from open pollinated and heirloom varieties. So, um, oh, thank you, Laura. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like I have my video on. Sorry, guys, for that. Um, but only save seeds from open pollinated or heirloom varieties. So the modern hybrids that we use today that are produced from crossing two or more inbred varieties, they're basically made to obtain specific characteristics, right? And so we're like, I want the tomato to be big and juicy. I want it to grow in a shorter amount of time, but to, you know, be sweet, or I want it to be whatever I want it to be, right? So we have all of these expectations from mother nature and her answer to whether or not we can save those unrealistic expectations is no, right? Um, because next year when you plant it, it is not going to be the same seed. It's not going to be the same variety that you planted the year before. It's gonna revert to the various parent, whatever that may be, right? So you definitely don't want to save seeds from hybrids unless you want some mystery vegetable. Um, <laughs> the, what'd you say? It could be a fun experiment, but it I wouldn't. Be, yeah, yes, it could be a fun experiment. What's this tomato going to be? What's this <laughs> going to be? Um, the, the second tip is that um, when we talk about seed purity, a lot of seeds freely crossbreed, like cucumbers, peppers, melons, squash. So when we talk about like our crop plan, we have to make sure that we are spacing them appropriately. So that way we can preserve the seed purity. Um, the third thing is to make sure that your seeds are dry before storing, because that is also going to help. You don't want to go through this whole process of making sure that the seed is pure and making sure that, you know, it came from an heirloom and then the seed molds because it wasn't dry properly. Um, so for that tip, if you squeeze the seed with pliers and it shatters, then it's dry. And if it doesn't shatter, then you need to let it dry a bit more. And then the fourth tip is just to store it in a dark, cool, dry place, right? So wherever that may be, your basement, underneath something that's dark, I don't know, in your greenhouse, because that's gonna be pretty cool in the winter time and just put it underneath a shelf or something like that. So wherever space that you have available, um, just making sure that your seeds are protected um, so that way you can use them in the spring. Next slide. And so now I'm going to get into cover crops, which I love cover crops. Um, I'm a cover crop girl through and through, but I'm also going to bring up some other methods. Uh, if you guys Aren't a cover, or if you guys don't love cover crops as much as me. So cover crops are a great way to protect your garden from weeds and soil erosion over the winter. Um, they protect your soil. They can be dug into the earth before the spring. So you don't have to rip them out. You could cut them up and just turn the soil over if you want to. Um, that just improves the soil's ecosystem and it just feeds your it feeds your plants um, with all of these type of essential nutrients. And also the big 
the, the wonderfulness of cover crops is that they do all the work for us. So I'm really all about working smarter and not harder. So if I could plant something, that's going to give my plants everything that it needs before I even plant them, then yes, I want to go that route. And as we know, as we go throughout the seasons, we notice little things about our soil. We notice like, oh, this is loomy, or this is clay soil, or this was a little too dry, or this, this didn't retain water the way I wanted it to. We can specify our cover crops to fix those little things that we saw was happening with the soil. So that way, come next spring, we don't have those same issues. So next slide. We're going to get into some of the cover crops. Um, so Facilia, which is a new one uh, that I just learned about, guys, and it's awesome. I even recommended it to some of my farmer friends, and they're like, oh, I'm going to use this as a cover crop this um, winter. So that was really exciting. <laughs> so this one is really beautiful. Um, it does a really great job of suppressing weeds. It helps improve your soil structure. So maybe if you have very heavy soil, you might want to use this cover crop. And then it also is really great for pollinators, so attracting bees, hoverflies. So you could plant this now, and then in the spring, you could just even leave some, just leave some there, um, just to, you know, attract some beneficials into the space. Another one is buckwheat, which I said is like the OG of all the cover crops. I mean, you, you can't go wrong with buckwheat. I mean, you just really can't. Um, so it just enriches your soil. It's also, um, it's also really great for the beneficials because it has nectar and it's also a weed suppression. So it's like, they don't have facilia, but they have buckwheat. Feel free to swap them out and interchange them as you need to. Um, next slide. I know you guys have questions. I'm gonna answer all your questions at the end about cover crops. <laughs> um, the next one is mustards um, and salads. So we have like cereal rye that has like the deep fibrous roots. Um, I think rye is really like, everybody knows about rye is pretty standard. Um, that's also really good for the heavy soils. And then mustards, which I think look beautiful, just that that yellow just reaching back everywhere, just making the garden look so festive and alive, even though it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. Um, and the also great thing about mustard is that it grows really fast. It produces a lot of foliage. So if you have these really large beds, just, you know, broadcast seeds of mustard and you'll be good to go. Um, and then prolific salads like mache or corn salad may be also grown this way. And the really great thing about mustards or even some of the variety salads is that they can be edible cover crops, which Kristen thought was really awesome. <laughs> um, and But it also like depends on context, right? Timing and then the availability of eating other things. So probably like when you first plant them and they're growing, you probably could, you know, harvest a little bit from them. But after that, I would say come spring, you shouldn't be trying to eat any of that mustard. You should be just trying to put that back into the soil. Um, and you can also do this really cool thing uh, uh, called edible ground cover. So that's basically when you just broadcast. So any type of brassica greens like kale, arugula, spinach, um, those things you might have to keep in a row cover, but it can be done. Right, um, and it won't really help fix the nitrogen or fix the soil, but it will provide like organic matter and it will keep the ecology of the soil active like throughout the winter. So that's also something to just kind of throw in there. Um, the next slide <laughs> is talking about um, legumes, which are like winter fill beads and peas, and then red crimson clover. I love crimson clover. It looks so beautiful, like that red, beautiful little bud just kind of sticking up and attracting everything. And these are really great because they add so much nutrients back to the soil. Um, if you've been planting a lot of cabbage, if you've been planting a lot of beans, you need all of that, you know, nutrient fix back um, into the soil. And uh, as well as like the legumes, you know what I mean? So like clover and vet, hairy vetch and 
the winter fill beans and peas are really great for the nitrogen. What I will say about the hairy veg guys is just disclaimer, it is so difficult to get out of the soil. I will tell you that now. <laughs> that way in the spring, you're not like Chantel told me to plant hairy veg. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you it is difficult. So there you go. Now you know. Um, and the next one we're going to talk about if you're like, I don't like cover crops. It's too much work. I don't like having to cut things down. I don't like having to turn my soil over in the spring. I just want to plant and go. I hear you, right? So all cover, no crops, right? A no-till method, right? So the first one is a sheet mulching. And I got this image from Farming Wild Black by Leah Penniman. Shout out to Leah. That's my girl. Um, so <laughs> sheet mulching, you just utilize uh, paper, mulch, straw, basically anything. You can even use leaves for this. And then you literally just put a sheet down over your bed. Um, and it acts as an insulator for the soil. It protects the soil's natural ecosystem and helps with weed suppression. And then any straw or any mulch or anything that didn't decompose can be used as mulch in the spring. So you could just like literally like rip the sheet from underneath and then just plant, just move the, the mulch and the straw to the side and just plant directly into it. So I thought that was really cool. Um, the next slide is tarping, which is always fun. Um, <laughs> and it is just another way of doing sheet mulching without the sheets. So if you're like, I'm not wasting my sheets, um, you can get black tarp or you can get black plastic bags. It also is a great insulator. It heats up the soil. Um, and also I, what I love about tarping is that because it's heating up the soil, and, but it's black, so the weeds are growing and then dying, and then growing and then dying. So you're literally killing weed seeds and you're not doing anything. Um, it also like protects the soil's ecosystem and helps with weed suppression. Also a picture that I got from Farmer Wild Black. And then the next one that you can do is this lasagna gardening, which I thought was really cool using cardboard and compost and you just you can also like add mulch to this if you want to put mulch on top if you're like i'm not just gonna put compost and leave it there you know you can add mulch on top or you can even add a tarp for more effective decomposition of the cardboard if you're worried about the cardboard breaking down you can also wet it um, before you put the compost on top and this also helps with like natural the natural ecosystem and helps with weed suppression so you can literally begin all of these, all of these no-till methods at any time, but it usually takes several months to a year. Um, so you want to start this in the fall. So like if you have some cardboard or you have tarp or you have sheets, uh, you might want to just go out after this presentation and just start, or maybe you could do it tomorrow. I think tomorrow will be fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And um I'll just add, I think like what we're trying to drive home here is that uh, it is best to cover your beds with something. Over yeah, the winter. And exactly. So, like, Chantel just gave uh, so many options, but you can, there are even more than what she said, um, but just putting something to cover it over will really like protect your, your soil that you have existing in your beds. Um, yeah. Because throughout the winter, it's gonna, if you don't do anything to protect it, all of the snow and the, like all the frost and the freezing and unfreezing, all of that is just gonna like sap the life out of your, uh, out of your soil. So these are just some great ways to, to keep it a little healthier and happier. Yeah, definitely. And, and honestly, a lot of people, they live by this no-till method. Um, they say it saves time, it saves energy you preserve the overall soil structure because you're not digging. There's no digging that's happening. So you're not turning the soil over and exposing new weed seeds. Um, and like, you know, it just makes things a little bit easier if you're willing to put in a little bit more work um, come the fall time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And next slide, I'm gonna get into some recipes and then you guys can ask us 
all the questions that you have because I see the yeah. Q&A. <laughs> There's mess. a lot. I've, I've noticed we have some questions in that Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and yeah. some of them in the chat. If yeah. you have a question in the chat, if you can just move it over, type it in the Q&A because that's going to be a lot easier for us to sift through. But We're we going to start with the Q&A questions. Oh, yeah. so we will, <laughs> so you have you know, a better we'll, chance. Yes, so get them into the Q&A. <laughs> Yeah, so we literally just threw these um, two recipes in here. One is for the Three Sisters Tacos, and the recipe will be available to you guys later. Uh, as you can see from Kristen's face, she loves these tacos. <laughs> so this is kind of nice because it kind of brings us full circle from, you know, paying tribute to what we're growing in our gardens and how we're doing that. Um, so we'll give you the recipe and kind of the background story for these in the follow-up resources. But what I love about this recipe is you don't need a specific variety of produce. You can use any type of squash you have, whether it's summer squash, fall squash, pumpkins, um, anything you have. You can use corn or if you don't have it, that's okay. Or any types of beans or peas or legumes and, or, you know, anything you have growing. So don't be afraid to do any substitutions for whatever you actually have in your garden or what you can find at your farmer's markets and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll follow up with the recipes for these. And the next one is just a vegetarian chili. And like Laura said, well, I love chili, um, especially a vegetarian chili. And it's so great because you can literally put anything in it, um, which I love is just having that freedom to kind of be like, okay, well, I'm going to put this and I'm going to add potatoes. I'm going to do this. So, you know, feel free to check out that recipe as well. Yeah, I think we're all getting a little tired of quarantine cooking. So <laughs> your rotation, yeah, <laughs> spice things up. All right, we okay. are ready for questions, Kristen. Let's do it. Us. We're gonna fire away here. Um, so going back to the beginning when you're talking about like row covers and season extension, is there a specific type of row cover that works best? And they cited like burlap versus plastic. Um, it, it's up to you what you like to use. Uh, so um, when you're talking about burlap and, and plastic, it's sounding more like that you're using that as like an insul like an insulation or a mulch. So that's yeah. not something I would put like over the, the plants that are currently growing. But if you're putting it there to just kind of be like a blanket for the plants, uh, e either one works. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to do one that's a little more breathable. Um, yeah. That you know, if you put plastic down, you're sealing everything out and everything in. So you, know, you have to be a little more diligent about making sure that there's still some like breathing room in there for. Yeah. And if you're putting the plastic on the ground level and then you cut a little hole for the plant to pop through. So that'll be good. They're both good right. for suppressing, both for suppressing weeds and for keeping them warm. Yeah. Uh, somebody would like to know if they should still prune diseased black eyed Susans, even though they have flowers on it. I, I think I would, I would just cut that down. Yeah. If you want to be very nice to the birds, you could yeah. so cut it, cut the stems off completely at ground level and then just take them and like put them in the woods somewhere else. Yep. So then the animals can still get to them, but you don't have to worry about spreading the mildew in your own garden space. Yes. Um, when should I trim my pepper plant and around how much of the stem should I leave? So this is, is for indoor. You just rip it out of the ground, rip yep. all the roots out. Yeah. Peppers are an annual vegetable. They're not coming back. Uh, so those are the annual vegetables. They're going to rip up from the root. And if there's no disease on it, you can compost it. If you're worried that it did have some signs of disease, then just throw it away far away in the woods or the trash. Yeah. Okay. This person uses fabric grow bags. If her plants have powdery mildew, do I have to wash the fabric grow bag as well? There's a chance the powdery mildew could still have remnants in the bag. It depends how much of a problem it is for you. Um, so yeah, I would, you could, you could, if you can empty it of all the soil yeah. and then <laughs> like throw it in the wash or something, you can do that. Yeah. I mean, or you could just like put like a piece, like write it on like a piece of tape and put it around that pot and put powdery mildew on it so that way you know next season 
that whatever you grow in there might get powdery mildew. So you could just hit it with a solution before it even starts, you know. Yeah, you might just want to try planting a different type of plant in yeah. that bag because yeah. it might not be like something that's not as susceptible to yeah. that. I would, yeah, definitely don't plant the same thing. Yeah. Um, even if you wash the bag, don't plant the same thing. I think, yeah, if, if you can do it, right, if it's too much of a pain, you could try one of these other, <laughs> other things. <laughs> the easy, uh, yeah. We have a question about where to store seeds in the refrigerator. Um, their apartment gets really dry, paper bag, plastic bag, wax paper. Um, I mean, a paper bag, wax paper. I know some people put seeds in the refrigerator. Um, I don't think it really hurts. You could put it in the cabinet. Um, yeah, the only thing I would caution against is don't put it in a plastic bag because uh, the con it could get condensation and you want to keep your seeds as dry as possible. So yeah, keeping them yeah. in a glass jar yeah, um, or a paper bag is best. But an envelope. Fridge, an envelope, yeah. 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 Fridge should be okay. Yeah, even if you have like like your dresser, like putting them in envelopes and then putting them in the back of your dresser. Closet. Your yeah. closet, yeah, anything. Uh, squash with powdery mildew. Should we also pull out the roots when pruning to prevent the problem recurring? And how can we treat the soil to prevent spores hanging out in it? Um, he's heard cinnamon helps. Well, I mean, I, I didn't try cinnamon, but I've heard that from some of my farmer friends. Um, you definitely want to rip that whole thing out, throw the whole thing away. Um, nothing you could do with it at that point. Um, and just make sure that next season you don't plant <laughs> any of the cucurbits there. Like try not to do like any cucumbers, no melons, no type of squash, nothing. Um, maybe don't do brassicas there either. Uh, I don't know. It's so powdery mildew is just equal opportunity. So you just whatever you plant there, just make sure you know like okay, there was powdery mildew here. Um, and I did everything that I could, but it might come back. Yeah, that might be for next season. You might just want to plant a cover crop in there. One of the ones that Chantel mentioned, um, and give it a season of rest yeah. with something else and then try again. Oh, facilia, do facilia. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. We have so many more. We have a lot of questions about how to prevent powdery mildew or eliminate it. So Anything else you want to add to the uh, powdery mildew conversation? <laughs> I mean, powdery mildew is really the bane of my existence, to be honest. Um, it always gets my beans and the, and the snap peas. Uh, and there's, I mean, you can do like a vinegar and a water solution that usually helps. Um, but like once it kind of gets going, you just have to like tear everything out. Uh, it's also sometimes you get powdery mildew not because the plant is susceptible to disease but because of your watering practices. So if you're overhead watering, um, that is also going to have you more likely to get powdery mildew. So maybe switch up some of these overhead watering practices. Yeah, water at ground level and try to base things out a lot so that uh, you want to have a lot of air circulation within those plants that'll help prevent powdery mildew. Yeah, I know a lot of us really want to have like a really large yield and so we want to kind of push things together, but not having adequate air circulation is only going to be make the plants more susceptible to disease and rot. Uh, someone is asking in the spring if they should let their cover crops continue to grow. Um, it depends, like if you have one that's like facilia or buckwheat and it's really beneficial to the bugs and it's still growing and it looks beautiful, then yeah, why not? Um, maybe just keep a little patch in the corner or you can um, have, have some where some of your perennial stuff is if you want to have it, like put it in as, as like a native something, you know, uh, so it's really up to you what you want to do come spring. Um, someone's asking about using wood pallets for cold frame. You can build cold frames out of a lot of different materials and we have a, a follow-up resource that's got tons of different plans for building these things. So 
Um, I don't know if palettes are specifically in there, but there's something in there that you'll be able to like repurpose from the stuff that you have. So we'll make sure that's gonna go out in that distance learning page after this. Um, and somebody is asking about tropical regions, just to be super clear, we're talking about New York and sort of surrounding <laughs> states. Um, tropical would be like a whole separate workshop in and of itself. So we're talking about, we're from New York, we're growing NYC, so we're talking about um, New York City specifically. Uh, someone is asking if they should prune down their lavender plants. Oh, that's a good question. I meant to mention that. So you don't want to prune those down. You want to leave it. So lavender, sage, rosemary, those types of perennial herbs that are going to come back next year, leave it the way it is um, because that needs, leaving the foliage on there will actually help protect the roots throughout the winter. So just leave it as it is. In the spring, you may want to cut back some of the old growth when it's ready to start growing again. But for now in the fall, you want to leave that on for the cold weather. And uh, we've got some rosemary questions. So just so everybody knows, it's three now. We're going to answer questions for a little bit longer. We're going to get to as many of them as we can, but we have a lot of questions about rosemary. <laughs> um, can I move a well-established rosemary plant indoors for the winter? If so, do I do that in a large or tight clay pot? Clay pot. In total, um, and how much sunshine does it need? Oh, um... So it's up to you if you have like an established plant and you don't want to take the risk that it might die when you bring it in, because there is a risk, especially if it's well established, um, then you might just want to leave it. But if you are like sure you'll take the risk, then just dig up the entire plant, uh, put it in a big pot um, and give it as much sun as possible. I have like a potted rosemary plant that has survived a couple of years uh, in my apartment in my sunniest window. Another way to do it, it might be a little late this time of year, but for the future, you can propagate rosemary from just cutting off the stems for the new growth. So if you have new growth, it's like that lighter green and it's more bendy. Um, you can actually take some sprigs of that and put it in a cup of water and it'll grow roots and then you can multiply your rosemary plants that way. So that's also something like I recently did with my basil plants for the fall. I, I cut off some sprigs, I propagated them in water, I rooted them in water, um, and I have them growing now in, for the winter. Yeah, and that you can find the resource for how to water propagate on the distance learning page. So you guys- Oh yeah, we did a workshop on that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a risk to transplant anything that's well established like that. And so if you opt then to keep it outside, um, what are some of the ways that you can overwinter it? Um, rosemary is, um, you can like kind of leave it the way it is and it'll come back next year. If you want to give it some extra protection, you could put burlap sacks around the base of it or some other type of mulch around the base of it. And that'll give it some extra protection. Even like your, your autumn leaves, you can like kind of move them all around it. It'll protect it. Um, next one. So if they, back to powdery mildew, if they have used a like natural solution in the past and it worked, should yeah. they still remove the entire plant come the fall? Oh, so like they had powdery mildew, they got rid of it. Yes. And now they're wondering if they should remove it. I mean, or they'll prune it down. Just yeah. To, yeah. I mean, if it's something that should stay, like the one of the things that Laura said, like that could actually stay that's beneficial, I would say yes. But if it's something that you had to get rid of anyway, I would just get rid of yeah. it. Um, and they also have lemon balm, ch lemon balm, chives, oregano, rue, and rosemary thriving in, in planters. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to trim the chives, but should they bring the others indoors? That was a long list, but I think yes. Yes. <laughs> all of them. Yes. <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah, I didn't quite catch every single thing. Oh, sorry. Lemon balm, chives, oregano, rue, and rosemary. Well, the rosemary could stay out. Yeah, the I rue I think could stay out, and it'll come. It'll die over the winter and come back. Back. Yeah, and then everything else I would say to bring in. Well, the chives could also stay out, but then everything else I would say to bring in. Okay. 
Um, how often can row covers be used, especially when there is disease incidence in the in the planting area? Mm. Well, if the disease is happening because there's too much heat or too much water, then you would need to um, have more time when the row cover is not on the plants. Um, so you really have to be careful when using row cover, especially if you notice that there is disease happening. Um, and really just, if you see disease, just treat it immediately. Like don't put the row cover back on it because it's just going to spread <laughs> to everything else. Um, yeah, I think I think it's also it, it varies based on the on the thing that you're growing, but more than likely I would just say to get rid of whatever is disease and then monitor everything else very closely. Um, fig trees. Should she cover them in burlap? Yes, 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 yes. Fig trees. <laughs> I love fig trees. Um, so usually what you do is you cover it. It could be burlap or you can use a sheet. Um, and then you need like some twine. And then you just kind of wrap it all around and then let it sit. And usually you can cut it back. You could cut it back a lot, actually, um, because once you take that sack off and um, you take the string off in the spring, it's going to grow profusely. It's going to be like you like you never cut it. Um, so you could cut it back as much as you want to and put something over it and tie it up and, and leave it. OK. Um, next year, or well, this person's interested in um, planting some plum trees in containers. Mm -hmm. so do we have recommendations for um, growing fruit in containers. And if so, what, you know, how big of a container do you need if you wanted to do like a dwarf variety of a fruit tree? I think it tells you that when you purchase it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it says it on the, on the little sticker that it has. It has like a tag and it tells you like the depth that you're supposed to plant it at whether or not um, it's good for the zone that you're in. Uh, so all of that is kind of like there before you even purchase it. So just doing your research on what zone you're in and the depth level so you can buy the appropriate pots for it. Even for dwarf varieties, you're, you're probably gonna still need a pretty big pot. Yeah, don't get a small pot. You're just setting yourself up for failure. <laughs> um, so we have someone who's asking about preventing insects from eating collard greens. Uh, Chantel did a really awesome natural pest management workshop earlier in the summer, and that is on our distance learning page. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, and I think, I think we have gotten through the majority of the questions. I'm gonna check Ooh. the chat really quickly. Um, Oh, thank you. Everybody's saying we are terrific and thank you in the chat. Thank you so much. We always love seeing that love in there. <laughs> um, well, okay. So yes, you're all very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you that were asking about like missing some of the presentation earlier on, it is being recorded. We are going to share it afterwards. It's going to be posted on the distance learning page with follow-up resources and all of that will be emailed to you so that you'll have it right in your inbox. Um, so thank you again for joining us. We have our next workshop is coming up on October 28th and that is a wreath making with an organization called Making Brooklyn Bloom Again. Um, and that's using fall like colorful fall leaves. So yes. you collect all your own fall leaves and make a beautiful floral arrangement with them. Exactly. It's like all stuff that you should be able to find in parks um, or just outside. So um, we will hopefully see you back on the 28th for wreath making. And until then, uh, happy gardening. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>